Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. This is disaster recovery and business continuity for systemically important financial institutions. My name is Benjamin Felden, and with me here today is Felix Candelario. Hello, everyone. Both Felix and I are solutions architects with Amazon Web Services. This is where we would ordinarily be making a joke about you looking at the title of the session and then making for the exits frantically. Um, but we couldn't find a funny one, so we're just going to skip it. I'd like to start today's talk with um, going over what are the thoughts that we would most like you to leave here with today. And the first one is, we would like you to know that systemically important workloads are running on AWS, and this is happening today. And we will be talking about a customer use case and also demonstrate something similar to what this customer has built that we have built of our own. The second thing is that disaster recovery can be automated, it can be auditable, and it can be elastic and we will talk a lot about the benefits of pursuing such an approach. And the final item is, we'd like you to know that you can leverage AWS for disaster recovery while benefiting from those things that we mentioned, and at the same time, remain in compliance with your regulatory requirements. So what you can expect from today's talk is a conversation around how it is that you can modernize your disaster recovery solution. And we will show you a workload through which you can gain insight into a set of tools that will help you to achieve this goal of disaster recovery. Now, the workload that we will be talking about today happens to be that of a trading exchange. But even if that is unrelated to your line of business and you may not even be in financial services, it's really the tools, the methodologies, and more importantly, the process that um, we think is going to be relevant for some of the use cases that you are in charge of. And so keep that in mind as we're going along because we think that it's really a method to illuminate how you can apply these concepts for the use cases that you want to work on. So let's start by talking about what it means to modernize disaster recovery. But before we get into the modernization part, let's try to think about where we are today. I want to do a quick show of hands, but I promise it's the last one that we'll be doing today. You want to get your muscles flexing for a long week of reInvent. Um, who here is aware of or has participated in a BCP weekend? That is quite a few hands. <laughs> so for those of us um, who may not know, first of all, BCP stands for Business Continuity Planning. And a BCP weekend is an event that for some companies will happen twice a year, maybe quarterly, where the company decides that we are now going to test our readiness to cut over to what is usually a shiny, unused environment dedicated to disaster recovery. Now, these unfortunate events, um, like the name suggests, will happen on weekends. So you're probably going to miss your kid's soccer practice. And dozens of people from all around the organization will get on this large, chaotic conference call where everybody is talking on top of each other. And they are running through these complex checklists for hours and hours and hours until the environment finally comes up. And that is if you're lucky. If you're unlucky, it never comes up. Because some minor change in firmware or software or operating system has been modified in prod, but not in DR. And what's even worse is that the learnings or the findings from the last BCP weekend may have not been remedied correctly. And so you're working through the same issues again and again and again. Any of that sound familiar at all? So we certainly hear from our customers that it does, and, and they talk to us about the frustration that they feel with how disaster recovery is run today. And what we tell them, and what we'd like to tell you today, is it doesn't have to be this way. With some upfront work, your disaster recovery can be automated, 
auditable and elastic. And you accomplish this first and foremost by enshrining your disaster recovery solution as code. Because if it's code, then you can automate the instantiation of the entire environment. And if it's code, you can automate testing and apply unit testing methodology. And if it's code, you can version control it and be able to audit it and be able to say with absolute certainty who changed something and when. If it's code, you can only pay for it when it's instantiated, and that alone is very compelling. So effectively, what this means is no more BCP weekends. Instead of this being a single time event that you maybe run every three months, every six months, you can be doing this continuously and constantly have an indication of how ready you are to cut over to disaster recovery. Now, this problem of the current condition of disaster recovery is certainly shared by a lot of customers. But for some customers, business interruption could actually have an impact which is larger, has a larger blast radius than for the specific business. And so much so that it can actually have an impact on our national and international markets. And as it turns out, there is a three-letter government agency that has decided to worry about this, and they're trying to solve it with regulation. So the SEC is mandated with keeping orderly markets. And they designate certain financial institutions as systemically important financial institutions. And as part of their charter, it is to be concerned with these institutions remaining available in the event of a disaster. As part of that came Reg SCI, which is a commission created by the SEC to strengthen the technology infrastructure of the United States security markets. So they designate certain financial institutions as SCI entities and are very prescriptive in how SCI entities should maintain and monitor their disaster recovery solution. So they call out things that are very specific, like you must have geographic diversity between your different sites. And you should be able to meet a two-hour recovery goal. And so we wanted to talk to you about one such institution that has been designated an SCI entity. The International Securities Exchange, or ISE, is now a wholly owned subsidiary of NASDAQ. And they operate an options exchange. And on March 30th of this year, they put out a press release where they announced the first implementation of a securities exchange disaster recovery solution on AWS. And so ISE have gone through this process of modernizing the disaster recovery solution. And if you read through their press release, they talk about benefits such as greater availability and scalability and improved time to market. All of this by modernizing the DR approach and running it on our platform. So we wanted to show you specifics of what something like this would look like. And so we built something very similar of our own, a full-blown running exchange that has disaster recovery baked into the solution. And again, the idea here is to highlight the tools and concepts that you could employ in DR for your workloads. So I'm sure that a lot of you here may be quite familiar with trading. Maybe you have a brokerage account with Fidelity or Vanguard or maybe even Robinhood. What I want to do is I want to go over trading in general, kind of at a slightly deeper level, so that we're in the same page and so that we can illuminate the workload that we're going to show you today. So as you know, there are kind of three major participants in the trading ecosystem. There are customers. Those are folks like me and you, folks like pension funds and mutual funds. There are broker-dealers. These are folks like Fidelity or J.P. Morgan Chase. They accept orders from customers, and they send them off to the exchange. And then there are the exchanges themselves. And the exchanges themselves run infrastructure and services where trading actually happens. So what you see there on the right of the screen is what is commonly referred to as the book. 
Exchanges are where trading happens. And assets, like stocks, will get a symbol. And every symbol will have a book that looks a lot like this. So on the left side, you see the bids. This is the most amount of money that someone is willing to pay to get a hold of a particular symbol. And on the right, you have the asks. This is the least amount of money that a counterparty is willing to part with in order to sell a symbol. So let's look at the activity now that we kind of have this in mind. So let's say a customer comes along and they want to buy 50 shares of Acme at $25.11. So they put their order in through an iPhone and it goes off to their broker. Their broker takes that order and sends it off to the exchange. The exchange takes that order and updates the book and places that buy order at the top of the book because that is the most that someone is willing to pay for Acme. The exchange acknowledges that order to the broker, which then acknowledges it back to the customer. Another customer comes along, but this customer instead wants to sell 75 shares of Acme at $25.11. Maybe through the web or they call their broker and the order comes in and the broker sends that off to the exchange. And again, the exchange updates the book and puts that sell order, that ask, at the top of the book because now this is the cheapest that someone is willing to sell Acme. What we have now is a match because we have a buy and a sell order at the same price. The exchange updates the quantities and then sends fulfillments out to the brokers who in turn send that off to the customers. Now, that's about as complicated as we need to get to illuminate the workload we're gonna look at in a little bit. So let's move on. Now, there may be stock exchange operators here today. There may be some people that are in the know that exchanges can be complicated. What I have here on the screen are the general systems that are supported in exchanges. So when you look at them, these are kind of the common, lowest common denominator among the systems. So let's move through them from left to right. On the left, you have the customer gateways. These are the systems that accept orders from broker dealers. Remember, customers don't send orders directly into the exchanges. The broker dealers do. When the customer gateways receive the order, they parse it and then figure out where to send that order so that the matching engines can consume those orders. What the matching engines do is exactly that process that I showed you in the last slide which is they maintain the book for the symbol that's been assigned to them. As that book changes because new orders come in, maybe orders are canceled, maybe trades and matches are made, it emits data, and that data is valuable. That data could be the latest price of a particular symbol, it could be the best bid and the best ask for a particular symbol, and that is transmitted so that the matching, the market data engines can consume that data and make it available to third parties. So if you've ever seen a, a financial show um, and at the bottom of the screen you see a ticker scrolling across the bottom of the screen showing the latest price, that's a form of market data. So we're gonna show you something that we lovingly call AEX, which is short for Amazon Exchange. We aren't uh, marketing experts and we lack a little bit of creativity, so that's about as clever as we could get. So AEX is our exchange and it's gonna support 100 symbols. We're gonna support 100 broker-dealers connecting into it. Each one of those broker-dealers will have 100 customers behind it sending orders. And every second, those customers are gonna send either a buy or a sell order for a random price at a random quantity for a random symbol. Now, we like to pretend that AEX is running over in uh, Eastern Seaboard, maybe in Mawa or Secaucus or Carteret or Weehawken, uh, these cities out in northern New Jersey where maybe some of you know major exchanges run. 
The truth is, of course, that it's running in US East 1, one of our regions, because it's a lot cheaper and easier to get servers than it is to get servers at a colo. But pretend with us. So if we should suffer a disaster, and by, uh, by that I mean a disaster where both our production and our backup facilities are rendered inoperable, we're going to initiate our DR strategy. And that is to instantiate AEX in US West 2, which is a region centrally located in Oregon. Now, to pull this off, we had to look through our toolkits and select the right tools to do this. So we have a tech stack. And at the top of our tech stack is AWS CloudFormation. That is our service that allows you to enshrine your infrastructure as code. And you do that by creating templates. What we've done is we've used a Python module called Troposphere that actually lets you generate CloudFormation templates for you instead of having to write them out manually. You'll see that at the heart of our solution is our EC2 container service. This is a service that manages Docker containers on your behalf. All of those Docker containers need to talk to each other. And they're going to talk to each other through multicast. Today, multicast isn't supported on our platform natively. So we took a partner tool called WeaveNet that's provided by a partner of ours called WeaveWorks to pull this off. There's a problem in the industry that's commonly referred to as service discovery. It's this problem where you need some components in your system to be able to know what other components are supporting what services and to provide that knowledge without hard coding it. We've solved the service discovery problem in a pretty interesting way using Amazon Route 53, our globally available cloud DNS solution. And we'll show you how that works in a little bit. Our last two services we used in tight concert. As you can probably guess, the state that's most precious to AEX is the state of the book. So what we've done is we've taken the state of that book and we are replicating it into S3. S3 is our globally available, highly durable object storage. And we're replicating the state of our book into S3 by using Kinesis Firehose, a service that allows you to stream data right into an S3 bucket. So this is what AEX looks like, maybe on a Monday like today. It's up and running. Broker dealers are connecting into our customer gateways and sending in orders. Our matching engines are receiving those orders and doing what they do, which is match. As the book changes, we replicate it to that S3 bucket over in US West 2 using Kinesis Firehose. Now, if we should encounter a disaster, and remember for us a disaster is both prod and backup going down. Connectivity from the broker dealers will go down, and our matching engines will no longer receive orders and will no longer match, and replication will stop. It's at that point that we take our CloudFormation template, submit it to the service, and instantiate all of AEX. Once that environment is up and running, it will go and rehydrate its state by pulling the book from S3, where that state was being previously replicated. It's at that point that the broker dealers will reconnect into AEX over in US West 2, where we will resume operations and continue replicating to that S3 bucket. So. We promised you a disaster recovery talk, and I know that you would feel cheated if we didn't bring in our friends RPO and RTO. In fact, it's the law. We have to. <laughs> so let's do some quick definitions just as a reminder. RPO is the maximum targeted period in which data might be lost from an IT service due to a major incident. Right? So RPO is a number. 
and it gives system architects like us something to work towards. RTO is the amount of time that the business can be without the service, without incurring any significant risk or loss. In the diagram here, the arrow represents time. And the blue dot on the left represents the last time we took a snapshot and have persisted it in a way that is going to be usable for our DR site. So between the blue dot on the left and the disaster, is the amount of time for which you find data loss to be acceptable. That is what RPO represents. The blue dot on the right is when we have recovered our process and we are back to being online and operational. So RTO is the amount of time that it took us to recover from the moment of business interruption all the way up to full recovery. Now, with those things in mind, let's think about AEX. The RPO for AEX is zero. There is no data loss. And the reason we're able to achieve this is because of the way that we implemented the replication of this workload's precious state, the state of the book. So in the exchange's code, Felix has gone to the effort of making sure that whenever an order is completed, it gets stored both locally as well as on the DR side at the same time, and thereby guaranteeing that the state of the book is identical on both ends. Now, RPO for a given workload consists of many things. How you replicate your state, how do things fail when they fail, in what sequence. And also keep in mind that if this mechanism that you're using to replicate your state is broken for whatever reason, RPO just started clocking. And so that tells you how closely you need to look at this thing and how loudly to sound the alarm if it's not working for whatever reason. Now, understandably, we are able to achieve an RPO of zero because we control every aspect of this demo, from the clients, from the customers, to the broker dealers, to every piece of this demonstration. In a live environment, in a real environment, an RPO of zero is unlikely but it is something that you can work towards. The takeaways here are, the more closely that you couple storing or persisting your state, both locally and remotely, the lower the RPO is going to be. The second thing is, you should treat that replication mechanism as part of your production. Now, RTO for AEX, and again, RTO is the time that has elapsed between the event of business interruption, and when you have resumed. So you may decide that you are going to cut over to disaster recovery automatically. And so you would have some form of monitoring system that is looking at your entire environment and is aware of an incident and makes that call and initiates the cut over. Or you may be thinking about this as a business decision. And so you want an executive to make that decision, and then it's initiated manually. Regardless of how you do this, it falls squarely into your RTO. So you want to think carefully about that process and optimize it as much as possible. The other part of it is the technical part, right? How long does it take us to bring up our entire environment, rehydrate state, and resume operations? And that will be shorter if you run your disaster recovery environment 24 by 7, or it'll be a little bit longer if you are instantiating it on demand. In our case, we're doing it manually. We're going to take a CloudFormation template, submit it to CloudFormation. The matching engines will come up. They will pull their state from S3 and be able to resume operations. At that point, our broker dealers will be able to connect again and process orders. That entire process takes us seven minutes. So the entire environment, lock, stock, and barrel, is brought up in seven minutes flat. And again, we could have made that number a little bit lower by deciding we're going to run our disaster recovery 24 by 7. But we feel that that negates some of the benefits of what we're talking about today. And also, seven minutes, we were kind of happy with it. 
So now we'd like to show you our exchange in action. I'll make a quick clarification though before you will see that the, some of the demonstrations have been pre-recorded and that is so that we can kind of stop along the way and talk about the different pieces in time. So like Felix was saying, we start on a regular Monday, maybe not the cyberest of Mondays, just a regular Monday. Everything is good. The exchange is humming along. We're processing orders. Broker dealers are connected. All the while, we are replicating the state of the book to Oregon. This is a dashboard that we've built to look at our entire environment. We use a partner of ours called Datadog. And Datadog makes it very simple for you to um, aggregate different metrics that you want to look at and different sources of data, like log files, and gain some meaningful insight from it and plot it on a dashboard like this. So what we can see is our production site, our backup site are both in status OK. And we can see that orders are being processed at a healthy rate. Our DR site, however, is in status unknown. And that is because it is not spun up. It is, in fact, dormant at this point in time. And then this happens. Look at that thing. He's huge. It is Godzilla. Godzilla has emerged from the Atlantic Ocean. And as it turns out, he is quite upset. And he has a particular grievance with the financial sector. He is unhappy with his 401k returns. And he's worried about his kid's future, his many, many kids. And this has had a calamitous effect on AEX in both prod and backup. And we are no longer able to accept any orders. Miraculously, though, the broker dealers have survived. And they're not just functional, they're eager more than ever to process orders in light of recent events. This is what our dashboard looks like at this point in time. Both prod and backup are in, stat are in critical status. And transactions have screeched to a halt. And this looks like an unmitigated disaster, only it isn't. It's very much mitigated. We have been replicating the state of the book to Oregon. So keep in mind that right now, we're well within the RTO clock. Right? Disaster has struck. We're no longer accepting orders. And it's now that we need to make the decision to cut to our disaster recovery site. Yeah, we should do that. Like, we right should now. do that. Like, hurry up. Now is the time. So this goes back to the point that we were making earlier. This could be an automatic process that a uh, monitoring system makes. Or it could be a manual process that's gated by a human because you view it as a business decision. In our case, we're doing it manually. We're loading the template via the CloudFormation console. And if we did this automatically, there'd just be a lot less to show you. So let's look at CloudFormation. So this is a CloudFormation template. And if it looks like code, that's because it is code. It's written in JSON. You can write it now in YAML. And you can declare all of your resources within a CloudFormation template. Here we're defining an ECS cluster. You can define things like EC2 instances. All of the EC2 instance properties are available here. So if you wanted to, you can define the size of an EBS volume. You could define what Amazon machine image to use, even what instance size and type to use. And all of this you can write manually, right? It's just text. What we've done is we've written some code that leverages Troposphere, that Python module, and we're using code to generate code because we wanted to bring the full power of a full-blown programming language to this. We wanted to take advantage of things like iteration and interpolation. So here you see that I have a quick for loop to define five EC2 instances for me. I could have written it manually, but instead I wrote the code to go write that for me. Here's an even better example. You'll remember that AEX has 100 symbols. And what we're saying here is for every symbol that we support in AEX, I want you to create a Route 53 resource record set in the format of symbol.aex.com. And that's how we're going to solve 
that service discovery problem that we talked about a little bit earlier. So we'll take this Python script and we'll run it. And that will generate this CloudFormation template. Now we put that CloudFormation template away. We rerun that script if we had to, if we made changes to it. But for now, we're going to go ahead and submit that CloudFormation template to the CloudFormation service. So you see me here doing it manually. But it's going to result in an API call. You can touch that API call in ways that it will allow you to automate it by using an AWS CLI or using one of our SDKs. And that will let you put it into a script that then you can have run in response to an event. So it's fine that we're doing it this way right now, but if you wanted to, you can automate that. So now that we've submitted the template, you'll see here that the CloudFormation service is saying this template is now being created. When we refresh the screen, we see that events are now being generated. And those events correspond to resources being spun up on your behalf. Everything that we wrote in that CloudFormation template that we generated using that Python script is now being brought up. So what you see here on this resource tab are all of those resources. They include the Route 53 record sets, the ECS tasks and clusters, even the EC2 instances. It's all there. When you submit a CloudFormation template to the CloudFormation service, it creates these resources, and we refer to these resources as a stack. So at this point, after Godzilla messing our stuff up, we will have submitted the template, and now CloudFormation is doing its thing. So with the power of time travel, we're going to travel forward in time, but not to the distant future, to the very near future. In fact, just about four minutes into the future. And this is what four minutes from now looks like. The CloudFormation service is saying, this stack is complete. So if you look at the time, it was 11.52. And the stack complete is 11.55 and some odd seconds. So about four minutes or so for all of this to get spun up. Here now are all of those resources that are part of the stack that were created. And you can see that they're all created complete. So that entire environment is up and ready for service. So we have our entire environment ready to go. Right? We could now start bringing up our processes. What I want to do is go ahead and dig in a little bit deeper into what this architecture looks like. So I hope that this slide looks familiar to you. And that's because we modeled it directly after a slide that we showed you a little bit earlier when we were talking to you about the general systems that are in exchanges. So if we work from left to right again, you'll see we have the customer gateway cluster, the matching engine cluster, and the market data cluster. All of these are ECS clusters that are supported by EC2 instances. Across that whole cluster, we have an overlay network made possible by WeaveNet from our partners, WeaveWorks. All of those containers are going to talk to each other over that network. And there are auxiliary services that we'll go into a little bit deeply. But we're going to start first at the customer gateway cluster. So as we log into the ECS console, you'll see we have the three clusters that were in that previous diagram. As we move into the customer cluster, you'll see that we have five EC2 instances. And this is because we've configured the agents to register with this particular cluster. These EC2 instances all have properties like the amount of memory and CPU available to them. And as they become busy, because containers are running on them, they're going to report metrics. And those metrics are going to be aggregated by the ECS service and be represented as the metrics for the cluster. ECS has a concept of tasks. Tasks have all the parameters required to get a container up and running. You can define things like the name or where the Docker image is located. We're locating our Docker image on ECR, the private registry for ECS. 
You can define things like how much memory and CPU should be allocated to this container, as well as what network bindings are required to make the workload work. You all can also assign environment variables that will be available to the container runtime environment. And we use that, and we'll show you how we use it in just a little bit. So a quick note about this diagram. Everything here except for the highlighted portion didn't exist. That's because we spun it up when we submitted the CloudFormation template. That highlighted portion we were using when we were in production. We were replicating the state of the book to S3 via Kinesis Firehose. So let's look at what that looks like. What you see here is the Kinesis Firehose dashboard. It has a concept of S3 delivery streams. And we've created one for every single symbol that we support on AEX, which means the matching engines write to their S3 delivery stream associated with the symbol that they support. If you look at the properties of an S3 delivery stream, you see the name, the prefix to use when it delivers data to the bucket, as well as what bucket. You can set properties like buffer interval and buffer size, as well as whether you want that data compressed and encrypted. If we go into the S3 bucket where those S3 delivery streams are delivering to, you're going to see 100 folders. Those are prefixes that we've defined for every single one of those S3 delivery streams. So there's one there for every symbol. And as we start to click in, you'll see that the directory structure is chronological. Kinesis delivers it in this way. At the time of this recording, that last object in this particular folder is the last replicated state for that particular symbol. If we dig into the matching engine code, you'll see where we did that replication. What's important to note here is that this is the only code we have. We don't run separate DR code. There's just AEX code. So here I have a function that receives messages. And those messages alter the state of the book because they can result in orders or trades or canceled orders. And what I have here is a line to write to Kinesis Firehose. And I'm telling it to write to the S3 delivery stream associated with the symbol that this matching engine is supporting. Now, because we only run one version of code, we have configuration flags where we can say, hey, if you're running in recovery mode, you need to go run a function that's going to go pull the state of the book from the S3 bucket that we were replicating to. And that's how we accomplished the rehydration of state for AEX. So we talked about that service discovery problem a little bit earlier. In our particular workload, the way that it rears its head is we need to somehow tell the customer gateways where to send orders for a particular symbol. We didn't want to hard code that stuff because this environment is dynamic. It's brought up when we need it. So we don't want to tell it about IPs and stuff because that stuff changes. So what we did is we took advantage of Route 53, our DNS solution, and we've created DNS records for every single one of our symbols that the customer gateways use to resolve what multicast address to send orders to. The matching engines resolve the DNS entry associated with their symbol and then subscribe to the multicast address associated with that symbol. And that's how they consume their orders. If we dig into the Route 53 console, you'll see that we have this container. It's called a hosted zone. And it's a logical container that contains Route 53 resource record sets, DNS entries. So we've created a hosted zone for AEX that's private and can only be resolved by AEX. And what you see in that private hosted zone are 100 DNS records, one for every symbol. And we've randomly assigned a multicast address to each one of those DNS entries. So when the customer gateways or the matching engines resolve symbol.aex.com. They get back the unique multicast address that they have to either publish to or subscribe to. 
we'll dig in a little bit further to show you that mechanism of how the matching engines do that exact process that I just showed you and how WeaveNet falls into this. But I want to make a quick note here, just in case there are any stock exchange insiders here. If we were actual operators of AEX, we would be very particular about where we would place our containers for a particular symbol. There's two ways to place containers using ECS. You can allow ECS to go ahead and place the container for you. And through its algorithm, it can place it on one of the EC2 instances. Or you can be very prescriptive and say, I want it specifically on this EC2 instance. And as an exchange operator, you may want to have a more busy symbol supported on an EC2 instance that's less busy. So at this point now, our infrastructure is up, and we're starting up our processes. And as part of that, we're starting up all our matching engines. And what you'll see is that we have 100 tasks up and running. And that's 100 tasks because we've got 100 symbols. You'll see that the metrics are now incrementing. And that's because our EC2 instances are busy. They're busy running those containers that are going to do the matching. As we click into one of those tasks, we're going to start to get runtime information that wasn't previously available. So now I have a container ID associated with the execution of this particular task. The other properties that we set earlier, like CPU, that stuff's still available. What you see here is that our environment variable, we overwrote when we said start the matching engine. And that's how we communicate to the container this is the symbol that you're going to support. What I've done now is I'm SSHing into one of the EC2 instances that's supporting the matching engine cluster. And you can see here the tasks that have been allocated by ECS. And we're going to attach to an actual running matching engine. What we see here are the processes associated with our matching engine. And we're going to echo the symbol. This particular matching engine has been told you're going to support the symbol for WDC. So if we ping wdc.aex.com, we get a multicast address that's been allocated to that symbol. And if we consult the multicast subscription table, you'll see that there's a membership for that specific multicast address on the ETH Weave interface. And it's that interface that gets plumbed in by WeaveNet. And that's what makes multicast communication possible across all of the containers. Now I'm SSHing into an EC2 instance that supports the market data cluster. And what we're going to do here is we're going to attach to a utility container. And this container is going to allow us to look at the state of the book on a matching engine without affecting performance. So at this point, we have our matching engines up and running. They've rehydrated their state, and the broker dealers have reconnected. This utility container has been told to watch the fictitious AMZN symbol. And what you'll see on the screen should look very similar to what we saw in the previous slides. This is a book being updated live. There are orders coming in from customers that are being sent to us through those simulated broker dealers. The bids on the left, the asks on the right. And when there are trades, they're going to appear on that bottom half as these matches are happening. So at this point, AEX is completely back up and running. Broker dealers have reconnected. And orders are coming back in and being processed. So with that in mind, what does the dashboard look like at this point in time? Well, production and backup are still in critical state, as you would expect, because they are operating in data centers that are in distress. But disaster recovery is in status OK. And we can see uh, a message rate, an order rate, that is slowly ramping up and is becoming healthy. I want to make a quick clarification about all of this, just in case we haven't made it clear. This is a fake exchange. We are not in a position to take money from you and give you securities in return. So keep that in mind. I have to remind Felix of that sometimes. 
I don't know about you guys, but we feel that this is a really robust solution. Let's talk about what all of this means. Here's what we accomplished. We relocated our entire exchange some 2,300 miles away. The AWS-related costs that we had prior to cutting over were negligible, right? We had S3, we had Firehose. That was about it. The rest of the environment was spun up on demand in the event of a disaster. We went from zero to hero in seven minutes flat. And we hit an RPO of zero, right? Because when we brought up our disaster recovery site, it picked up exactly where production left off. Now, this is a particularly hairy workload to try and figure out disaster recovery for, right? It requires multicast, which isn't natively supported. It has a lot of moving parts. It has all of these external entities that connect in. And so it is relatively complex. And some of the workloads that you will have to solve DR for may be substantially simpler or perhaps a little bit more complex. So we want to talk about taking this one step further. We just launched our disaster recovery solution in response to a disaster event. And we did so manually. We could have instantiated the environment automatically, like we said, in response to any kind of monitoring system that is aware of an issue and triggers it. But we could have done another thing, which was we could have launched it in response to any kind of code change, either in the infrastructure or the software that's running the exchange. That could have been a trigger to go and instantiate the environment and thereby gain confidence that that particular code change doesn't affect our DR readiness. Or we could do this on a scheduled basis. If you gain confidence knowing that disaster recovery is in good shape by running it periodically, you can do so weekly. You can do so daily. Bring it up. Make sure that it's ready. Tear it back down again. Regardless of how you're doing that, you will need to automate the testing. The better that you automate the testing, the more confidence you'll gain that this is actually a reflection of how ready you are. And I don't mean to sound like we're trivializing this process, because we're not. We haven't shown you a lot of, of that particular section, but there is a level of effort that's associated with this. You will need to write code. You'll need to develop the mechanisms in those code that essentially mimic what you're doing on a BCP weekend, but in a programmatic fashion that goes and tests your functionality end to end and then return some sort of healthy, unhealthy state. But if you do that, you can then truly tie this into a CI-CD pipeline, a continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline, where what happens is you can bring up the entire environment, launch it, run a full cycle of tests, gain the confidence that it is actually ready to go in the event of an actual disaster, and then tear it all back down. So why would you do that? Why would you do any of this? Well, one obvious benefit is you can pay for the environment only when it's running. And that is very compelling. But some of our customers will say, no, that's not how we do things. For us, disaster recovery is going to run 24 by 7 because we want to reduce the RTO to the bare minimum that it has to be. And that is fine. We have plenty of customers that pursue that approach, and we help them build a disaster recovery solution with those things in mind. But I would like to impress upon you that that approach doesn't negate all of the other things that we talked about. There is still a lot of benefit in describing your entire environment as code. For example, once it is described as code, you can audit it, all of it and then be able to say with absolute certainty who changed something, when it was changed, what was the nature of the change. And here's another benefit. This whole thing becomes reusable. We can take that CloudFormation template and spin it up in a sandbox environment. So if, for example, you have a development team that says, hey, we'd like to play around with our exchange. You spin up the same environment in a sandbox account 
and now they're working against what is essentially a complete replica of your production environment. By the same token, you could be doing this in a different geography. So if it's unfortunately, if it unfortunately happened that Godzilla has made his way to the West Coast, we can launch the entire exchange now in our newly launched region in Ohio. And it's just as simple because CloudFormation is spoken natively in every AWS region. So it becomes very, very simple. And here's another benefit. Your security teams are going to love you. Because if your environment is only running when you need it, that is a dramatically reduced attack surface. And isn't that something that they're always talking to us about, right? Any kind of malicious actors have significantly less attack surface to gain a foothold in. So I think these benefits are certainly worth the effort. And they're worth going through the process. So let's go ahead and talk about that process. It's a process that Ben and I went through as we were building these demos. It's also a process that we go through with customers on a nearly daily basis. It's what we do. So we start by understanding our workload. It's when you understand the business context within which your workload is working that you can figure out things like what's the most important state that I need to care for in the event of a disaster. You understand, well, what is a disaster for my particular business? Once you have that statefulness in mind, then you start to kind of look through your toolkit and say, how do I go ahead and replicate this state? For us, it was pretty simple to look at Kinesis and use that. We could have easily have done something like uh, block replication, right? But we looked through our toolkit and said, what can we use to pull off this replication? And then, of course, you have to monitor that replication like your life depends on it. You then have to put your architect hat on. And Ben and I, we've been at AWS now for a little bit, so infrastructure as code for us is it's bread and butter. We do it every day, so that's immediately where our thoughts went to. You have to become mindful then of where to refactor and where not to refactor. So an example where we refactored our workload was when I showed you that code for our matching engine, where we added that line of code to replicate to the Kinesis Firehose stream. A great example of where we chose specifically not to refactor was in multicast. Right? We looked at our workload, and we knew that we don't support that today natively on our platform. But we didn't want to go through the heavy lifting of rewriting all of that stuff. There's a lot of benefits to doing this in multicast. So we went and looked at a third party tool, and we used WeaveNet to pull it off. And then we came up with a mechanism to rehydrate the state, which is something you have to care for a lot when you're going through this process. These last two points, the testing and the automating, they're kind of a bit interesting because they point to behaviors. And those behaviors, they exhibit themselves when you look at a process that maybe your firm has been doing manually for decades. And you have to interrogate and say, why are we doing this manually? Let's start automating that. That behavior, that's a part of culture, right? It's a part of your IT department's culture. And as you know, culture takes a long, long time to shift. It can. And that's why when we talk to customers, we constantly talk to them about being on a journey, because changing culture can take a while. So maybe there are some folks in here today that haven't yet started on that journey. And that's fine. Maybe you'll start today. There may be some folks here that are in the middle of that journey and are wrestling with these things right now. And then there are some of you that are at the end of that journey and have bought all in and harass Ben and I and call us and tell us this is how you should be doing things. And no matter which customer you are, we want to talk to you about that journey. Ben and I are SAs, and in our daily lives, we talk to customers about this process and that journey. We have colleagues that are technical account managers, that are professional services folks, who want to talk to you specifically about this journey. And I hope that you'll take us up on this offer. So with that, Thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate your time.